Women make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, but only 20% of its leadership. On her story, we'll explore the careers of bold and influential women from Silicon Valley to Capitol Hill and learn how they've overcome the odds. This is Her Story, a program where we explore what's beyond the glass ceiling. Well, welcome back to Her Story. I'm Sandra Jane, Chief Research Officer at Trillian Health and a member of the Her Story Advisory Council, and I'll be hosting today's conversation. And today I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Melinda Bunton to the program. Dr. Bunton is currently the Mike Kerr Professor and founding chair of the Department of Health Policy at the Vanderbilt School of Medicine, and has truly built an accomplished career at the intersection of health economics and health policy. Melinda, thanks for being with us today. I am delighted to be with you and uh, to join such an interesting group of people that you've had on this show. Well, we're we're thrilled. I'm so excited to have today's conversation. I'm definitely a little bit biased as a fellow health services researcher. And so I've had the pleasure of studying your work, you know, throughout my entire career. And I'm um, excited to introduce you to our audience. You've established yourself not only as kind of one of the nation's leading health services researchers and health policy experts, but really from my vantage point, have been a champion of bringing evidence-based principles to practice. And as part of that, you know, you've founded a lot of different initiatives, which we'll dive into momentarily. But as you think about your foray into healthcare leadership, I'm curious if you consider it it to be more accidental or intentional. Yeah, that was a hard question for me to even think about. I've been asked it before, and I would say this. I think I've been opportunistically intentional. So not accidental, because each time I'm in a leadership position, I take it very seriously. I think hard about the way I need to lead, um, uh, the effect that I have on morale and motivation. Uh, but I am not one of those people who throughout her career has always looked to what's the next job I'm going to do? What leadership opportunities am I going to move on to? I always focus on doing the job that I'm doing now to the best of my ability. And that has led me to have opportunities throughout my career. And so then at what point did the interest in health policy emerge? So I uh, I can pin down that I started to be very interested in policy in high school when I started, um, when I took a foreign policy class. And so it's often an inspirational teacher who can get you interested in the subject. And then I gravitated towards health over time because I realized that I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. And Doing that in the context of healthcare was where I could really use my problem solving skills, um, my interest in economics and policy, uh, and bring them to bear, you know, within this country um, on the everyday lives of people. Because healthcare is just one of those things that touches every family deeply. And yet it's such a complex system that requires so many both in, um, industry and government levers um, to make it run arguably as well as it does run now. <laughs> The field of health policy formally in terms of, you know, going to get your doctorate or getting a you know, master's degree in it is something that I think has become slightly more common in recent years. But, you know, when you set out to get your Ph.D., I suspect it wasn't a very common path that many folks took. And so I'm curious, like, what was the healthcare landscape like when you were you know, deciding to enter graduate school? Like, what were the conversations in healthcare at that time? Yes. So I uh, graduated from college right in the midst of the Clinton health reform plan. Um, And I got a job in Washington, D.C. It was very exciting to watch everything unfolding with those debates. And I looked at what happened and the failure of the Clinton health reform plan and who had played a big role in those discussions. And I felt like it was the health economists who had really swayed the day. And I decided that I wanted to go back to grad school to be a health economist, to be there when the debate came around again, and to be able to talk about not just the costs of healthcare, but the benefits that we get as a society when we have more access to healthcare and more complete health insurance. Uh, so I was highly motivated to get a doctorate, become a health economist, and be part of a policy debate using that degree. But you're right, it wasn't that common. So I did enter Harvard's PhD program in health policy. I think I might have been in the sixth cohort, um, but the, you know the people in the original cohort were still around. And the field is still growing here at Vanderbilt. We um, have just started a doctoral program in health policy. And we are just looking at applications for our third cohort now, and we have fantastic people applying. Um, So the field is still a growing one quarter century later. 
<laughs> yeah, I remember when I was applying to, to programs, it was like it was, a lot of folks, a lot of uh, universities had a health policy program, but it was either buried and it wasn't explicitly called out. Mm -hmm. And then there were a handful of ones that actually did. So it's mm -hmm. going to be exciting to see how that changes over time. So, you know, one of the things I think that is really fascinating about your career is that you've really spent a lot of time in each of the what I'll call subsectors, right? So you've spent time in the private sector, government, now academia. How were you thinking about your path, you know, coming out of finishing your doctoral training, you went over to Lumen Group and ran, like, what did you set out to do at that time? Yes. So I worked at the Lewin Group, and that was where I got exposed to a wide variety of health policy issues, again, against the background of the health, Clinton health reform debate. Then I went to get my PhD at Harvard, and then I was faced with choice of a, a lot of different places where I could take my degree. And I decided to go to Green Corporation. And the reason was that I realized about myself that I, number one, worked best in teams um, and best in multidisciplinary teams because I benefited so much during my doctoral career from work coll collaborating with clinicians and sociologists and people in other disciplines. Um, and then two, I realized that the work that I wanted to do, um, looking at the healthcare system writ large, um, required access to data and programmers and a whole team of people that could help me really, you know, do what we would now call data science in health policy. Um, but then we just thought of as, as using, you know, really using huge numbers of Medicare claims and the like to do research. And RAND seemed like the best place to do that. Yeah, RAND is definitely one of the preeminent research institutions from, from day one in that regard. You know, so from there, you also then went on to be the chief economist. And if I get the title right, it was like founding director of the Office of Economics, Evaluation and Modeling, right? Yes, within, yes. Uh, a long title. <laughs> within the office. The office. Yeah. Yeah, of the National Coordinator for Health IT. So just, you know, because I feel like this this field of health economics, health policy, health services is, is really um, complex just for our audience's purposes. Like, what did you do? Like, what was your charter in that role to start? Well, you know, when I talk about being opportunistic, I think this is a great example of it. So obviously, um, this was uh, shortly after President Obama was elected, um, was, was elected president, and there were a lot of things going on in the health reform arena. I had been at Rand at that point almost um, 10 years, like nine years, and I thought it'd be interesting um, to play a role in what was going on, but I didn't know exactly where I'd fit in. And I spoke with someone um, who I'd met early in my doctoral career career, uh, Dr. David Blumenthal, um, who is now the president of the Commonwealth Fund. And we'd written a couple of papers together early in my graduate career. And then, you know, he hadn't uh, mentored me for my dissertation, but uh, we'd kept in touch through conferences and the like. And he was named national coordinator for health IT. And I went to talk to him about working uh, for him. And I started out by saying, you know, David, I, I really don't know anything about health IT. Uh, and so I'm not sure if I'm the best person for this job. And he had a very ready answer to that. And he said, you know, I need you because I need an economist who can think about the incentives that we're creating um, when we're implementing the High Tech Act. And I, number two, know that you care about the end goal. You care about using health IT to improve access to care, care quality, um, and health outcomes. And you see health IT, like I do, as a means to an end. And you're going to pick up all the technical knowledge that you need to along the way. But what I need you here for are these things that you do bring to the table, um, which is that economic perspective. And I would say that uh, that I did perform that role sort of as, as his economic advisor. Um, but then I realized that there were other things that I could lend my expertise to, including evaluation methods, modeling of adoption of healthcare and the like. And so that's when um, what had turned from really an advisor role um, into an office director role. Uh, and, and that group grew um, because there were so many things that needed to be done to support the billions of dollars that we were trying to spend wisely to bring the healthcare system forward you know, into the 21st century. <laughs> so not only did you basically kind of create your job and you sought out the opportunity, but you basically founded a division within a kind of established organization. Now, arguably, you know, this was at a time when there was a lot of change happening in the healthcare period. Yep. So there was probably a lot, lot of, a lot of moving pieces, but just to unpack that a little bit for us. I mean, how do you, how do you even start that? Like, what were the conversations as you say, David, you know, we're, we're going to start this, you know, team and this is what we're going to do. Like, what were the conversations? 
the office was growing so fast. So you're, um, people remember this is a while ago now, but this was a great recession. Congress passed a stimulus bill, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Part of that bill was called high tech and included money to give uh, doctors, hospitals and other healthcare professionals incentives to adopt electronic health records. Um, and there were literally billions of dollars worth of stimulus um, uh, uh, funding available to give incentives um, for those healthcare play organizations and players uh, to adopt health IT, but also billions of dollars worth of grants to uh, bring forward and, and advance that agenda. So we really had to spend money quickly, but wisely. And that meant that we had to staff up and that we had to act really like a startup within government. And so even though we were part of the Department of Health and Human Services bureaucracy, there's you know, more than 60,000, 70,000 people who work for HHS nationwide. We would have meetings, literally weekly or biweekly meetings where everyone would come into a conference room and, it, you know, and stand up. We'd have those standing meetings. That was not a thing in government at the time um, to figure out how we were going to break down barriers and award grants quickly and efficiently, get programs um, and regulations promulgated quickly by working with different parts of government and the like. So I really felt like we had a startup culture within an enormous, enormous bureaucracy, it must be admitted. You talked a little bit about kind of this startup feel, you know, within the government and a lot of, you know, fast paced movement at the time. You know, as I think about a lot of the things that you've gone on to do even since then, I think a lot of what sets you apart is this entrepreneurial mindset that you have, which, you know, uh, is not something we tend to attribute to those kind of in more of academic government context for what it's worth. And, you know, a lot of our friends out in Silicon Valley and kind of that sort of side of the house would talk about building things from scratch, right? They're building net new organizations, mm -hmm. but you've really built within. Have you ever kind of ha had this moment where you said, well, you know, maybe I should go start my, my own startup or my own company to go tackle some of these issues versus I'm going to go take a lot of these solutions and ideas to existing uh, institutions? Yes, I've thought about it a lot. So um, I really do think we had a startup culture at HHS um, in the Office of the National Coordinator at that time to implement that complete suite of new programs. Um, so that really was building something, um, not from the ground up, because there were people who worked in that office for years. Um, but again, the office, I think, quadrupled in size during my first year there and things like that. So really building fast, hiring fast, um, running fast in many different directions. Uh, and I thought I would probably go from there to something like Silicon Valley, like a health IT startup, because it was so exciting. You could see the potential. So how did I end up at another government job at the Congressional Budget Office? Well, I thought that in the wake of passing the Affordable Care Act, there would be a lot of attention to our other major health program, Medicare, where I spent a lot of my career um, doing research um, about how to improve the Medicare program. That did not prove to be true. So a lot of time was spent during my time at CBO sort of relitigating the Affordable Care Act, um, uh, considering repealing different parts and the like. But nonetheless, when I went into the Congressional Budget Office, and uh, you know, if you talk to my colleagues there, they will probably like remember and laugh all of my color-coded charts. But we really had to start a research agenda from scratch. The ACA for the Congressional Budget Office was an enormous effort. People worked round the clock, seven days a week, on this enormous piece of healthcare legislation. And then once it passed, we had to figure out what the next agenda was. What research did we need to be doing? What models did we need to be building to be ready for the next set of questions? And so we really did do a ground up exercise there to figure out how to redeploy this incredibly talented group of people to do the models and the research needed for upcoming health debates. So that was fun. Um, it was not starting from scratch, uh, but CBO is also actually a very small, sort of nimble and entrepreneurial agency. Um, believe it or not, there's really only a, a little bit over 200 people who work there, and that includes, um, you know, everyone from the IT people and, and the general counsel to um, to the people who run, who run models of the entire federal budget. So. Wow. So I'm sure you've heard this, but I, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the industry around kind of these parallels between what you're describing in terms of, you know, research and, mm -hmm. you know, doctoral training and research mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. And I'm curious how you think about some of the translatable lessons from like back to, you know, core research, you know, writing those dissertation papers to actually living in real life and, you know, being a part of these real time policy discussions. Like, where are the parallels? 
Yes, I totally remember sending an email message to my dissertation committee uh, after I'd started my job at RAND and saying, hey, who knew that working was a lot like writing a dissertation? I'm working on a project and I have these senior members of the team and I have a project officer and I'm accountable to them. And and then I remember, you know, they all wrote back and thought it was really funny, but true. And I think that's that's true throughout all of our career, right? We're, we're doing research, we're pursuing ideas, um, we work within an organization and, and whether it's our dean um, or someone who works at a foundation or the NIH who we're looking to to fund our, our work. We're always working within the structure of our team, um, our research question we're trying to answer, um, and then our clients um, who are the people who are going to use our research or promote our research. Um, and if other people don't find value in it, um, then you won't be, you know, you won't be funded and get that next project. I'm just kind of curious, like, have you observed, I guess, this like healthy tension of kind of those who create and inspire the research and, you know, see all this value, but then translating it over to the actual users and, and kind of make sure they understand the value of it and are able to apply it? Like, how do you reconcile those two, given where you sit, just kind of seeing both sectors? So that is one of the things that I work the hardest at in my career. So most recently, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning, I'm now at Vanderbilt. So I was the founding chair of the Department of Health Policy here at Vanderbilt and in the, in the School of Medicine. And I thought very hard and deliberately about what will set us apart. And what I have tried to do is imbue in my colleagues here in the department, um, but also um, let everyone around us in the School of Medicine know that we are not people who simply do research and publish it in journals, which is not to say that we don't do basic methods research and things like that um, as part of our portfolio, but we seek to influence policy and give decision makers the data and evidence they need to make good decisions. And so everyone in the department is incented um, and we talk about it constantly, how do we take this research, make it accessible and usable by decision makers? Um, so literally just yesterday, I was talking with my team about setting our performance goals for the year and everyone in the department has one of their pillars being how they're gonna help their team boost the policy impact of the work that we do. Wow. Well, that's music to my ears because that's exactly the intersection, you know, we both get to have the pleasure of working in. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to gloss over something, uh, you know, we talked about of founding a department, right? So you go from national scale working at, you know, CBO and the Office of the National Coordinator, and now you're bringing it local and you're going deep at a academic institution. Like, how do you do that, right? Where do you start of, you know, who do you pitch the idea to? How did you gain the buy-in? Like, what does it take to, you know, create a, a department, particularly in a field that, you know, yes, healthcare during, you know, because of the ACA and some of these reforms has gotten more attention and funding, but, you know, kind of where we started, health policy as an actual degree program and an area of focus is still not mainstream, I would argue. Yes, so uh, I'll take that question in a couple of different directions. Um, and one, I've already told you I'm opportunistic. So I discovered um, when coming to give a talk here at Vanderbilt that Vanderbilt was interested in having a Department of Health Policy. Um, and I, uh, I was looking for a new challenge. Uh, and this opportunity to really, again, have a startup in a strange place, have a startup in academia, seemed really exciting to me. And as I talked to people at Vanderbilt, I realized that Vanderbilt is a place where you can build things like this and where other people want to see you succeed. That said, in my first few meetings of uh, with other department chairs at Vanderbilt School of Medicine, they didn't really know what health policy was. Uh, I had to be sure to explain to them, you know, coming from D.C., everyone knows what health policy is. Here in, here in Nashville, not everyone knows what health policy is. So I had to build an understanding amongst my colleagues about what health policy was and what was the value that we were going to add to the institution. And that's an ongoing process because it's really important for me to do that and, and have our, our uh, work understood by our colleagues because we're all part of that same promotion and tenure system within the school of medicine. So we are constantly, I'm constantly working to make sure that people understand the value we're adding in health policy. And that's part of our mission 
with policy impact. I think uh, it's not hard for my colleagues to see that now, and especially during the pandemic, where we did so much research and analysis um, to help policymaking. I, I think we're more integrated with the school of medicine than we've ever been. Do you see that shift kind of happening nationally over time as you think about kind of the next generation of kind of educating our leaders from, you know, school of medicine, school of public health, you know, school of business, like how do all these kind of disciplines come together ultimately in the broader field of healthcare? I do. I see a real change. Uh, I will say one of the things that I did, uh, you know, for myself as much as for my colleagues, was a few years ago, I wrote a piece uh, for the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst about the role of health policy in schools of medicine in the U.S. Um, and so I looked at all of the degrees granting institutions, and it was clear immediately from the data that all of the top 20 med schools had either a school of public health um, or a health pol that had a Department of Health Policy um, or a major center or institute of health policy within their institutions. And then all at that time, 140 some odd institutions um, granting med medical degrees, um, about half of them had some type of policy entity. Um, so it was clear we were getting established in the field. That said, I think we're still evolving towards the period of time when all medical professionals um, receive some training in health policy. So we're becoming more and more integrated with the School of Medicine uh, curriculum and the like. And I remember back when I began my career, I would, you know, I would often find myself talking to a medical professional and, and especially if that person was an older physician, um, there'd be a point in the conversation, I could just feel it coming where that person would say, now for you to really understand medicine, you need to shadow me for a week. And I always wanted to say, if you want to really understand the healthcare system, you need to come and look over my shoulder at my computer <laughs> for a week. But I was way too polite to ever say that. Um, but I think there's now a much broader understanding in the medical field that these things are both true, that we need to have an understanding of how clinics and, and, um, and hospitals and the like operate day to day at the real level, what's the real effect of healthcare policy and financing on the ground. But then also healthcare professionals need to understand how they fit into the broader system and why the system is the way it is. A big piece of that story is this idea of, of writing. And, you know, with research comes a lot of writing, but you know, I think it's such an important vehicle for how we share ideas and get get you know, different communities that think differently, especially as our industry has historically been, you know, so siloed. One of the additional initiatives that you've been really at the forefront of is your work uh, at JAMA. Tell us a little about kind of um, what, what that initiative is and uh, what your charter is. Yes. So I am the deputy editor of a still relatively new, um, because we've uh, been publishing um, original research for less than a year now, uh, a JAMA um, network journal called JAMA Health Forum. And it has been really fun to get off the ground. It's actually been far more fun than I ever expected. I work as part of a fantastic editorial team head um, by Johnny Anian at University of Michigan, who's our editor in chief, but backed up by a really professional team of people um, who handle the JAMA network um, and uh, produce and promote um, and ever see uh, what this, what our journal does. It has been great because I have been able to uh, see from start to finish, um, articles come in, get reviewed, get better, viewpoints get refined, um, but just create an outlet for our field um, where we just don't have enough outlets to get information out um, and uh, information, opinion, and original research. So it's been so fun. It's been really rewarding. And um, I get to work with, uh, with both wonderful authors um, and with wonderful colleagues on it, which, uh, you know, as you advance in your career, becomes more and more important to you that, that you get to work with, with people you enjoy being around. And I know one of the kind of um, goals is to diversify, you know, the perspectives and, you know, the individuals who are contributing kind of back to one of your things about bridging kind of theory and industry and practice. And so, you know, there are a lot of folks that I work with on the industry side, right, who have a lot of perspective to share from, you know, running a hospital or, you know, being in pharma and everybody aspires to write and, and share, but we get busy, right? And I'm curious, you know, as someone who is clearly juggling, you know, many initiatives and teaching and still doing research, like, any advice for how folks can kind of prioritize and, and make time for this type of thoughtful writing? 
it is so hard. So I'm just going to start by saying that like I uh, did continue writing and publishing while I had the government jobs that we just discussed. And because I did that, I've had opportunities to, for example, return to academia, return to Vanderbilt, to be an editor at a journal, but also to be able to write things that are, are disseminated and widely read. And that is rewarding when you've done all of the hard work to come up with those ideas. So that is what I would encourage people to do, even though it's hard. And I know it's hard because I wrote some of those things I wrote were nice and weekends and things. And I had small kids and stuff like that. It is great when your ideas are out there and you can engage with other people about them. So it is worth it. That said, I can promise your listeners that at JAMA Health Forum, we try and make the publication process as easy and painless as possible. We have really quick turnaround times. We have really smart editors who direct you how to re revise your piece very specifically. So it doesn't feel like a guessing game where you're doing round after round of revisions. Um, and so we're proud of, of our quick turnarounds and um, our very effective editing. And many people have written to me and said, thank you so much. Publishing in JAMA Health Forum was one of the least painful publishing experiences I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I think that that's really true. So on behalf of all the writers out there, I <laughs> thank you and the team for, for making that so. And, you know, I think underlying Part of that, though, is, you know, I'm seeing this theme in your career where, you know, there's a lot of these established, I don't want to say processes, but, you know, just norms of ways of how we do things. And the academic publishing is one of those. And so it, it I, it's not lost on me that it's probably no easy feat to put the things in place to make those review cycles faster and make it more accessible. Like, how do you, how are you able to internally with your teams, like, push the needle on that, right? Where these are things that have been in place for, for so long. You know, I think you, you said it yourself just now, it is the team. So identifying the high performing team uh, and the team that works well together. Um, and that means, uh, and the high performing team has got to bring people with different talents and backgrounds to the table. I really believe in that. Our team at JAMA Health Forum um, includes people from a variety of backgrounds, perspectives, disciplines, um, lived experiences, and that makes us a stronger team. Um, but we have a common goal, uh, which is to publish important and policy relevant research in a timely fashion. So that is, uh, you know, having that mission and having the right team to execute it uh, is, is the most important thing. So taking all of that together, kind of shifting gears a little bit. So going back to where we started, I asked, you know, so what inspired the interest in health policy? I personally have had the fortune of, you know, being able to read the work of, of folks like yourself and other, you know, women to kind of say, okay, this is a path, right? This is a career path. But when you started, I suspect that wasn't as common. And so I guess the first question is, like, how is the fact that, you know, you're really one of the few female health policy leaders, uh, you know, of our generation shaped your approach to kind of the industry, but then leadership at large? You know, I have, uh, I have been um, fortunate to not be among the vanguard generation um, and to have been able to work with women who were really part of that vanguard. Uh, generation. And a few years ago, I was thinking about some of the amazing women that I had the opportunity to work with in my career. And I realized a significant fraction of them were women who had chosen not to have children. Um, and so I am so grateful that for me, when I when I came, you know, um, behind them um, and had their mentorship, uh, that I had the ability to figure out how to have a really uh, how to have children and, and fit them into my career. And of course, I did have you know great mentors. I think like Kathy Schwartz, who was a great example of of balancing. Um, actually, I just used a word I hate. I got. <laughs> I hate the word balance um, when you're talking about career and family, um, but uh, but figuring out how to juggle. I think you used that word earlier, and I think yeah. juggling is a much better metaphor. How to juggle having um, having a career and family, and she was very straightforward um, with the graduate students that she worked with uh, about the challenges of doing so, but also the joys of doing so. So I was lucky to have people like her, but then also just these women who were inspiring and brilliant and dedicated to their career. Um, that was that was great too. And so, you know, zooming out along the way, there have been many mentors, as you've described, and, you know, 
bosses and colleagues, both male and female that have been a part of your career. What's been the most difficult piece of feedback that you've received from any one of them and how did you overcome it? Well, uh, I already mentioned David Blumenthal, who has been a wonderful mentor to me for a large part of my career. And I remember talking to him about the choice uh, to leave the Office of the National Coordinator. He had already left because he only had a two-year leave um, uh, from academia to do that. Uh, The choice of whether I should uh, take the job I'd been offered at the Congressional Budget Office. And he counseled me that if I took it, I would probably be closing doors for myself that I might not be able to return to a research career or academia because a second federal job sort of was going to brand me as a fed. Um, and, uh, and that was hard for me to hear. Um, and it didn't prove to be true because here I am at Vanderbilt, but he was right. And he was right to tell me that. And he was right to make me think hard about what I was doing. Um, and because he told me that, Uh, I did work hard when I was at the Congressional Budget Office to maintain ties to colleagues, to continue to try and publish research and the like. And that did keep doors open for me later on in my career. But that was that was hard to hear that I was making a choice that really could change my career trajectory. Um, But I'm glad he told me that. It's a really good thread, though, because I think many of us, you know, in, you know, touching academia in some form have probably gotten a version of that advice to some extent. And I'm curious, as you think about healthcare becoming more interdisciplinary, these labels of, okay, you know, you're really a, you know, you're a government person or you're an industry person. And I think a lot about that as, you know, I work in industry, but, you know, I I pride myself in still being an academically trained researcher and, and all of that. So how do you think about, as we think about the next decade of careers and these kind of different subsectors, will we see more breaking down those labels? I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to frame that. I think that so many things will change. We probably can't even predict right now. I do think that there's no one now who questions the need to do multidisciplinary research to advance policy issues. Uh, that was not true necessarily 20, 30 years ago. Um, It's unquestioned now. And I think that openness to new ideas, styles of working and the like means that we're going to be open to people moving in and out of different types of research careers. Um, I think academia, healthcare, education, all these things have been challenged by the pandemic and will never be the same. And so that will also open up opportunities. We're going to figure out what's the right mix of virtual and in-person learning. Um, Same thing with teamwork. So there's just so many things about work that are going to change and yet aren't yet settled. I can't believe um, that the things that you've just mentioned about how we work and how rigid we think our career trajectories are won't change as well. Yeah, that's very well said. So kind of, you know, we've talked a lot about your different roles and your hats and I, you know, you've mentioned, uh, you know, being a mom and you're right, it's a constant juggle. And so along the way, I'm sure you've had to make a couple of different, you know, difficult decisions and trade-offs. Um, has there been one in particular that, you know, really stands out? When you have a two-career family, uh, sometimes you have to be willing to um, to make moves and take turns and things like that. Uh I remember when my husband decided that he we needed to move back to L.A. Um, we lived in L.A. when I worked at Rand, then relocated to the Washington office. And then he said he wanted to move back to L.A. Um, uh, to write a book uh, about the LAPD. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I have, a sm- I have a small child at the time. I thought the last thing I can handle is a transcontinental move. Um, but you do those things. And I think it was actually for the best for both of us. It was definitely the best for him because he wrote a book. Um, and, and that was a, a landmark part of his career. And it was great for me because I got to establish, reestablish those in-person relationships that I had had with my colleagues at RAND um, in the headquarters in Santa Monica. And so I think it was good for me ultimately, too, even though I definitely didn't see it um, when we were discussing the logistics of moving with a toddler. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. moving is never fun. So I can't yeah. trans and laughing. But, um, you know, so as you think about, you know, back to where we started, you know, if you think about, you know, young Melinda in high school, thinking about, you know, the all the career aspirations you had, what what's one piece of advice you would give your younger self? 
You know, it's so funny because uh, we have a Jim Health Forum podcast, and this is a question that we ask some of the authors that we have on the podcast too, and I never had to answer it myself. <laughs> um, so I guess one of the, the pieces of advice I'd give myself is to be always on the lookout for luck and seize it. And what I mean by that is that I remember my younger self hearing from people like this, like me on this podcast, talking about how lucky they'd been in their career. And I looked at them and I was like, you know, but you worked so hard and you're smart and things like that. And now that I'm older, I know how lucky I am. I know all the privileges I have and the opportunities I've been given um, and how I had, though, to be able to seize them, see them and seize them. Um, and so that is the advice I'd give to my younger self is to worry less about it and, and seize the opportunities that are presented to you. I love that. Well, so speaking of seizing opportunities, then you have really blaze a trail forward and have accomplished so much in your career. And you still have many more chapters of, you know, your, your book to write as you continue to, to make healthcare better. As you think about the legacy that you want to leave behind, and this is, this is the toughest question, you know, and what would be the title of your autobiography? Oh, I'm definitely dodging this one. I, I don't imagine anyone other than my family members would ever want to read my autobiography, but uh, I do, I have been starting to think about writing a book. Um, it was maybe, you know, sometimes they talk about how vacations can open up your headspace. So actually over this past holiday, I started thinking about how I actually could write a book, um, because there's been a thread through my career, uh, related to healthcare financing. Um, and, uh, since, you know, since this is a video recording too, I can show you that I pulled off my shelf this book here called The Problem That Won't Go Away. And it's an edited volume by Hank Aaron. Um, and it was published in 1996, uh, so a quarter century ago. Um, and it includes chapters by lots of people who are still prominent members of the health policy community, prominent experts in the field. Uh, uh, about the issues we were facing with health policy and financing, um, again, in the mid 90s. And so many of them are still here. So the problem still hasn't gone away. So what I would like to do is I would like to be able to figure out a positive spin on this title and say, I, um, and I don't know what it is yet, so I can't give you the exact answer, but I would like to write a book that says, here's some steps that we can make, take to at least reduce this problem. Um, and, and, and so I haven't figured out exactly how to flip this title from Hank Aaron's volume. Um, but that's my goal um, is, is to think about a book or at least a series of papers that will be really constructive about what we have learned about how to improve healthcare financing and get more value out of our healthcare system. I love it. And I'm also that. personally interested in, I feel like you're playing with all these different mediums and now you're doing some podcasting of your own. So maybe <laughs> you're going to find a way to, to bring all these modalities together. That would be great. That would be great if I could do it in uh, in a multimedia format. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Melinda, this has just been a phenomenal. Um, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Like we really appreciate all the contributions you've made to the industry and looking forward to continuing to track your work. Thank you for asking me. And uh, this has been a fun conversation and I know we'll have many more. Yeah, bye guys.